And these are words by Abraham Lincoln. And he shared, as labor is the common burden of our race, so the effort of some to shift their share of the burden onto the shoulders of others is the great durable curse of the race. As I would not be a slave, so I would not be a master. This expresses my idea of democracy. Whatever differs from this to the extent of the difference is no democracy. Our reliance is, on, is in our love for liberty. Our defense is in the spirit which prizes liberty as the heritage of all people in all lands everywhere. Destroy this spirit and we have planted the seeds of despotism at our own doors. Those who deny freedom to others deserve it not for themselves and cannot long retain it. Why should there not be a patient confidence in the ultimate justice of the people? Is there any better or equal hope in the world? Let us have faith that right makes might, and in that faith, let us, to the end, dare to do our duty as we understand it. My friends, it's getting dark out. And our mission as a religious community is to shine a light. What's life without a risk? <laughs> Thank you. I didn't warn the first row, but I thought about it. I want to speak about myths. I want to talk about what makes America great and our American myths. There may be others, but this is about two prominent and incompatible American myths. And this is about why our true myths are more important than ever. The first is the myth of the rugged individual living by determination, grace, and grit. We've all seen the movies, Great the Grid is making the land productive in the face of drought and Indian assaults. The individual and perhaps his wife struggling to make a land, fighting alone and winning or at least keeping the foreigners, the Indians, at bay. Finally, in the last scene, as that rugged individual frontiersman is holed up in his house or barn protecting his family, or is behind some rock where he has retreated, he says to his wife and child huddled close, I have only one bullet left, son, but here's a lesson you should never forget. Although I won't be there to guide you, remember this. You can only rely on yourself, and Americans never give up. But before that last bullet is fired, off in the distance, as everyone stops to listen, a bugle call is heard. And like Mighty Mouse, <laughs> the cavalry arrives. Here I come to save the day. Anyone ever seen that myth on the big screen? It's never mentioned that this is the government bailing out individuals who rightly and justly have no business on Indian land in the first place. <laughs> Hollywood loves this myth, and so too does the rancher grazing his land on his animals on public land while complaining about government interference. That myth is also loved by big oil, soon to be lobbying for their rights to retain industry tax break, breaks and the right to use public land for drilling and mining. That is also the myth loved by the homesteader farming the land in the middle of the country, even though the Homestead Act gave them government land. It could even have been the myth shared by the slaves freed by the Civil War, since they were promised 40 acres and a mule on January 16, 1865, by William Sherman's special field order number 15. That could have been their myth, except the 40 acres and a mule never happened. 
President Andrew Johnson, Lincoln's successor, a staunch unionist from ten Tennessee, but a Southern sympathizer, overturned that order. And as historian Barton Myers sadly concludes, quote, return the land along the South Carolina, Georgia, and Florida coasts to the planters who had originally owned it, to the very people who had declared war on the United States to deny black people freedom. I think it was the seventh grade, perhaps it was the eighth grade, when we studied American history. The first semester took us through the Civil War. The second semester started with the Western frontier. The balloon over my head said, oops, we never studied about Reconstruction, the period immediately following the Civil War. Now, believe it or not, in school, I was very reticent, nerdy, rarely making waves of any kind, and rarely working hard, but that's another sermon. <laughs> but as that second semester teacher started their, her first lesson with the Wild West, I raised my hand and said, but we skipped over Reconstruction. Her curt answer was, that was covered in the first half. I somehow got the courage to say, but we never got to it. I was told to sit down, being told that was supposed to be covered in the first half. Why do we ignore Reconstruction? We ignore because that shameful return to white supremacy and our shameful history of slavery, Jim Crow, and discrimination, which continues to today, puts the lie to our founding principles and that first John Wayne myth. No, America is not the land of that myth. There is another myth, though, a truly noble myth. That myth could be called the melting pot. Wave after wave of Irish, German, Polish, Italian, and Jewish people created an immigrant stream from Ellis Island to California. And as they became Americans, they make this country great. And there are other usually ignored streams from China and Japan and Mexico and South America. People coming to the land of the free, the land of opportunity, whose streets in thoughts even today all over the country are paved with gold. That American myth is dramatized by the poem The New Colossus by Emma Lazarus writing in 1883. Here at our sea-washed sunset gates shall stand a mighty woman with a torch whose flame is imprisoned lightning. From her beacon hand glows worldwide welcome. Give me your tired, your poor, your huddled masses yearning to breathe free. The wretched refuse of your teeming shore send these homeless tempests tossed to me. I lift my lamp beside the golden door. What makes a country? Often it starts with a tribe or leader who conquers and unifies neighboring peoples until one supreme people call it a country. The Bible tells this story as Moses and Joshua conquer the promised land. Usually a country is cohesive because of ethnic commonality. When Italy became a country in the 1860s, its revolutionaries consolidated city-states because they shared a common language and a common history, the glorious Roman heritage. Bismarck unified Germany from many German states through common language and, sadly, conceptions of race. The artificial boundaries established by world war and colonialism have resulted in constant warfare and ethnic cleansing because those artificial boundaries never shared common ethnic or tribal unity. Too often, we can read about internal ethnic strife all over the world. Ethnic and cultural unity is the usual glue which holds a country and government together. 
Our United States was founded on a very different principle. This country was founded not on a principle of cultural, ethnic, or religious unity, but rather as set forth in our truly revolutionary document, the Declaration of Independence, a profound political, philosophical principle about inalienable truth, regardless of diversity. The principle that all men are created equal and endowed by their creator with certain inalienable rights. However, hypocritically, those slave holders wrote those words. 50 years later, Abraham Lincoln led the country through a terrible civil war to make a reality, or at least begin to make a reality, of the word all. 154 years ago and 137 miles away, Lincoln said, now we are engaged in a great civil war testing whether that nation or any nation so conceived and dedicated can long endure. So conceived and dedicated meant our founding principle, the equality of creation. As I was writing this sermon, Linda said, Mark, it's a sermon, not a legal exegesis. <laughs> if she knew the, term it, the turn it was taking, she would have added, or a historical lecture. Undaunted, I searched out a lecture written by Eva Braun, one of our most respected professors at St. John's College, which I had purchased for 75 cents in 1968. I had saved it for 48 years. It's called a reading of the Gettysburg Address. This reminded me that Lincoln fought to preserve the Union and free the slaves as a sacred mission to preserve this remarkable philosophical basis of nationhood, nationhood and to try to correct its most glaring hypocrisy. He called these political principles moral sentiments. And lo and behold, I originally had Sakura Blue, but I didn't think I could pronounce it properly. <laughs> Who should appear in this lecture but the abolitionist Unita Unitarian minister, the Reverend Theodore Parker. The words of that great Unitarian are relevant today because he was speaking, writing, and preaching in times of deadly division, disruption, and intolerance. Times like ours, when hate was on the rise and civil discourse was not at all civil. His words are relevant to us today because the sacred founding principle which does make our country great and unique in all the history of the world is a religious principle. Four score and seven years ago, our forefathers set forth on this continent a new nation dedicated to the proposition that all men are created equal. Our country was born in the notion that that's a self-evident truth. Reverend Parker said, quote, Human history could not justify the Declaration of Independence and its large statements of the new idea. The nation went beyond human history and appealed to human nature. This same self-evident truth we call our first principle, the inherent worth and dignity of every person. Parker distinguished between what he called satanic democracy, characterized by selfish interest groups battling for power, and the form of democracy to which America should aspire. In his words, quote, there is no permanent and real welfare for any one portion in society except in connection with the welfare of all the rest of the society. That identifies the problem that we who believe in the worth and dignity of every person confront today. The Roman politician and philosopher Cicero 
identified three criteria for public moral goodness. The first is the ability to distinguish truth from falsity. The second is the ability to restrain the passions. And the third is to behave considerately and understandingly in our associations with other people. Our parallel UU principles are the fourth, a free and responsible search for truth and meaning, and the second, justice, equity, and compassion in human relations. Sadly, our public discourse today violates all three of Cicero's and our UU principles. How must we as individuals and a religious community that believes in the inherent worth, dignity, and equality respond? How must we respond as anti-American evil people are given license and empowered to crawl into public view? Towards the end of my judicial career, when I understood I would be soon retiring, I became fixated on Nazism. Book after book, beginning with the fiction writing writer Philip Kerr, whose main character, Bernie Ginther, is a moral Berlin homicide detective at the start of the Third Reich. Eventually, he can no longer tolerate Nazi Germany police work because when a body is found, he understands that the murder investigation will stop should he determine that the victim is Jewish. He recognizes that if he really wanted to apprehend murderers, all he needed to do was take down the names of the Nazis who were beating people up on the street, and when a victim died, arrest the perpetrators. I read spy novels, history, histories, memoirs, newspaper articles, and finally I realized this mini obsession was an attempt to answer the question, how does one live morally in a society grounded in hypocrisy and racism? I became more and more depressed until I was finally able to stop after I read Eric Lawson's comment in the book, quote, In the Garden of the Beasts, concerning all the research he did. Quote, what I did not realize as I ventured into those dark days of Hitler's rule was how much the darkness would infiltrate my own soul. Sadly, today we can torment our souls just by reading the paper or watching the evening news. Many politicians lie either knowingly or ignorantly making promises which in the result prove to be impossible. Few, but sadly some today, follow Goebbels' policy of the big lie. In Mein Kampf, Hitler spoke about a lie so colossal that no one would believe someone could have the impudence to distort the truth so infamously. The principle that when one lies, one should lie big and stick to it. Keep up the lies, even at the risk of looking ridiculous. The United States Office of Strategic Services described the big lie this way. Never allow the public to cool off. Never admit fault or wrong. Never concede that there may be any good in your enemy. Never leave room for alternatives. Never accept blame. Concentrate on one enemy at a time and blame him for everything that goes wrong. People will believe a big lie sooner than a little one, and if you repeat it frequently enough, people will sooner or later believe it. Does this sound sadly familiar today? These thoughts of what really make America great are not mine alone. Two weeks ago, David Brooks' writing in the New York Times contrasted these same American myths. Quote, I've rewritten it a little. <laughs> the tribal story. Good, honest Americans are being screwed by aliens. Regular Americans are being oppressed. White Americans are being invaded by immigrants who take their wealth and divide their culture. Their tribe needs a strong warrior in a hostile world. 
This is a deeply wrong and un-American story, he says, because we are not a tribe. We are founded on universal principles, attracting talented people from across the globe, active across the world on behalf of all people who seek democracy and dignity. These Americans tore down social, racial, and legal barriers to give poor boys and girls an open field and a fair chance. Today, the main enemy is not aliens, it's division between rich and poor, white and black, educated and less educated, right and left. Where there are divisions, there are fences. It may be dormant, but this striving American dream is still lurking in every heart. It's waiting for somebody who has the guts to say no to tribe. Yes to universal nation. No to closed and yes to open future. No to fear-driven homogeneity of the old and yes to diverse hopefulness. The same thoughts appear in this month's Atlantic magazine. Quote, the article is, is the American idea over? And amazingly, it quotes our Reverend Parker. The American, this is from the article, adjusted. <laughs> the American idea, Parker declared, comprised three elements, that all people are created equal, that all possess inalienable rights, and that all should have the opportunity to develop and enjoy those rights. The Civil War tested whether a nation built around that idea could long endure. When the Union prevailed, it enshrined this vision in the Constitution with a series of amendments banning slavery, extending equal protection, and safeguarding the right to vote for Americans of all races. All this has left Americans feeling disoriented. Their faith in that, their faith that their nation has something distinctive to offer the world was shaken. On the left, Many have gravitated toward a strange sort of universalism, focusing on American flaws, flaws while admiring other nations' virtues. They decry nationalism and covet open borders, imagining a world in which ideas, ideas can prevail without nations to champion them. Our political rhetoric is curiously devoid of references to a common civic creed. Instead, a more generic nationalism, one defined like any other nation by culture and borders and narrow interests and enemies, is promoted. Both visions are corrosive. America is an ethnically, geographically, and economically varied land. What helps unite us is a nationalism grounded in a shared set of ideals, ideals that serve as a source of national pride, and future promise. Vitriol and divisiveness are commonly blamed for the problem of contemporary politics. But Americans aren't fighting too hard. They're engaged in the wrong fight. The universalism of the left and cultural nationalism of the right are battering America's sense of common national purpose. The nation's shared identity is crumbling. The greatest danger facing American democracy is complacency. The American idea is really that prosperity and justice do not exist in tension, but flow from one another. Amer achieving that idea will require fighting as if the fate of democracy rests upon the struggle because it does. The political world we confront today rejects our founding ideas, or at least seems to, and allows and encourages traitors to these ideas to come out from under their rocks. It's temporary. They've always been, been around. 
Being brought into the open air allows us to confront them. It is simply true and a religious proposition that those who support fascism, Nazism, racism, and sexism are not the moral equivalent of those who stand up against them, those who stand up for the worth and dignity of every person. Our country is waiting for us to have the guts to say no to tribe, yes to universal nation. So how do we individuals, families, and a congregation and a religion live morally in today's environment? I'm encouraged that we're not alone. A new energy has been released in our country. Young people everywhere recognize the dangers. People spontaneously gather to say, what can we do? And they act collectively. Our UU mission today, and it is our religious mission, is to proclaim from every mountaintop and public square that the inherent worth and dignity of every person is what makes America great. We must fight as if the fate of democracy itself rests upon the struggle, because it does. Do we fear that we are not up to the task? Ask Margaret Mead. Never doubt that a small group of thoughtful, committed citizens can change the world. Indeed, it's the only thing that ever has. And finally, other hopeful words you may recognize that were first said by Reverend Parker. I do not pretend to understand the moral universe. The arc is a long one. My arch reaches little ways. I cannot calculate the curve and complete the figure by experience of sight. I can, however, divine it by conscience. And from what I see, I am sure it bends towards justice. Thank you. Our closing words today are from one of our most underrated American heroes, Frederick Douglass. If there is no struggle, there is no progress. Power concedes nothing without a demand. It never did, and it never will.